Hello, and welcome to the Resilient Life Podcast. Resilient Life is part of peakprosperity.com. It's where we focus on practical and actionable knowledge for building a better future. I'm your host, Adam Taggart. Well, since my recent podcast on emergency preparedness with Matt Stein, we've seen the extensive damage Hurricane Irma inflicted on Florida, the absolute carnage Hurricane Maria is wreaking on the Caribbean, and a devastating 7.4 magnitude earthquake in Mexico City. It's been a sadly traumatic two weeks. Joining us this week is longtime Peak Prosperity member Chaz Peeling, an expert on backup electrical solutions. A key topic right now is the aforementioned disasters have knocked out power for millions. We'll be talking with Chaz today about the importance of having backup electrical solutions in place before emergency strikes. And we'll explore the pros and cons of the various types of solutions out there in the market. Chaz's company, Soul Solutions, manufactures portable solar generators, so I'm sure he'll have lots to say about those. Chaz, thanks so much for joining us today for this very timely discussion. Are you ready? Yes, I am. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks for inviting me over, Adam. <laughs> All right. Well, first off, give our listeners a quick background on how you came to be an expert in this field. Uh, well, I've been uh, living off-grid actually for quite a number of years, uh, kind of the homestead life or what I call the off-grid life, where you had to learn how to make your own electricity when you're not hooked up to the grid. And doing that uh, is, is kind of a learning experience, and it makes you more aware of where your stuff comes from, including uh, your electricity. And early on, starting in the 80s, I started learning about electric and, and solar and batteries just to hook up some lights or have radio or any kind of music or doing any kind of activity at all. So that was my start in the solar business, and it's been predominantly off-grid. Most of the time, I've also been involved in uh, electrical and uh, work in the construction trades too a number of years. And I've always had that interest on uh, resiliency, uh, you know, uh, homesteading and that kind of thing. Do it yourself. That's been my background. Soul Solutions has been going about 10 years now. We started building our own uh, made in USA solar generators specifically for temporary power, off-grid power and backup power. And uh, that's what we've been doing. And uh, we continually are adding to that portfolio and uh, offering solutions for people across the board for, uh, you know, providing their own power, lighting, that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's get to some of those uh, disasters that I mentioned earlier um, uh, and, and talk about the importance of, of having backup power uh, in case it goes out, whether it's due to a natural disaster or... Uh, regular blackout or some grid down event or whatever. Um, you know, you wrote a great piece on this topic for for the Peak Prosperity website back in 2012. What are kind of the key facts people need to know about this topic? Yeah, um, we uh, witnessed a lot of um, activity under uh, Superstorm Sandy and some of the earlier hurricanes in Florida, the uh, tornadoes that that hit uh, the South. Um, and one of the things that was noted, we'd always get a lot of calls coming in after the fact uh, because people realized um, the grid would be down. Um, you know, maybe people might experience only one day or two day, but certain areas where the uh, actual utility infrastructure was really destroyed, power lines and stuff, uh, people went through, you know, sometimes weeks without power in certain areas during these last disasters. The other thing that was, uh, it was a real surprise uh, for people not and not in a pleasant way is their usual backup, which would be gas generators. They suddenly realized there was no gas yeah. available. And that kind of uh, threw a curveball to a lot of people that thought, oh, well, I have a generator and I'll just plug it in. Um, there was another uh, a series of, you know, technical issues that need to be addressed and continually need to be addressed around how you go ahead and feed your own electric into your, you know, meter or into your house system that is constantly being addressed by, you know, electrical contractors and the utilities to do, be able to do it safely. Um, and, you know, resiliency and, and emergency preparedness, disaster preparedness across the board is a constant educational process to get you personally ready for when there's no outside services. And that could be a lot of other things, including water, gas, electric uh, availability, gasoline, the road closed, anything like that. So whatever you can have ready 
that's immediately available at your home or in your neighborhood is probably a really good thing at this point. And that is the definition of preparedness. Okay, yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about the people right now who live in Puerto Rico, right, that just took the direct hit from Hurricane Maria, where right now the entire island is without power. So it's not even like, you know, there's a neighborhood that you can go over that still has power. The entire island of three and a half million people uh, has no power right now. Um, so unless you you had some sort of solution line that like this lined up uh, in advance, you know, you are basically living in the dark ages <laughs> until uh, until the central authorities there start getting that system back online, which, of course, is going to take a long, long time. I think we're talking weeks to months here for many people. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. It's it's going to take uh, quite a lot of work uh, to put that back together. And um, uh, I would say, you know, utilities in the United States are, you know, fairly highly regarded, you know, service industry. And um, uh, when these kind of weather related disasters happen, there's, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, work and emphasis that's put on to restore power. But um, I the, the power grid is very much an essential component of our modern lifestyle across the board and it affects communication it affects food it affects water it affects you know transportation everything because it's all touched and run by electricity and when that electricity stops okay back to square one <laughs> what do you do yeah yeah um all right well Let's um, maybe let's start there sort of with the topic of electricity. So let's say I'm somebody listening to this podcast. Um, I'm watching some of these disasters happening and realizing that, uh, you know, the same thing could happen in my my area for whatever reason. Of course, out here in California, that's probably likely to be an earthquake, but mm -hmm. it certainly could be other things as well. Mm -hmm. um, and if I don't have, uh, you know, a backup system in place right now, um, what are the questions I should start asking? How, how should I start thinking about this? What are the... What are the different solutions out there? Um, how might I be looking at which ones might be appropriate for, for my homestead? Yeah. And then earlier you, you said, you know, some of this stuff requires, uh, or at least uh, electric contractors are, are involved in making sure this stuff is sort of set up safely and whatnot. How much of this could, could a, a regular, you know, person do who doesn't know a lot about electricity? How much do they need to rely on an expert for? Um, you know, basically, how would a regular person begin to think through all this? Um, well, there's, there's definitely a, a, the regular homeowner and person that wants to be more prepared for disasters. There's much you can do personally right now having to do with uh, sh the short term. Um, and there's stuff that you can get that's available right now across the board to markets that has really come along that is all about short term power that's small and portable, almost consumer, consumer grade. Um, one of the key things is lighting. Um, very important uh, that you have lighting both in your house and if you have to go outside. So there's a bunch of new technology having to do with the new uh, smaller lithium batteries uh, with solar inputs and LED lights. That has transformed uh, a lot of the portable and personal lighting solutions that are out there. Um, you know, if your batteries run down or you can't buy batteries from the store, that's not going to help you. But there is quite a lot of new, uh, you know, lighting devices from flashlights to camping lights to you name it that have very long batteries that don't run down that can be solar charged and or charged from any kind of bigger uh, input such as a generator or your car. Uh, many, many of them now will plug in a cigarette lighter or they'll plug into a bigger battery pack or, or you know, charge off a generator or charge off the sun. Um, those are highly recommended these days to throw in your glove box of your car, have in your emergency backup pack that you might keep at your house. Um, you know, everyone should have one of those. They're very reasonable price now and they, they've really kind of got them down. Um, this is something that we've added into our portfolio and kind of sorted through some of the best. Um, and I've literally had flashlights I've thrown in a glove box or a drawer for six months or a year longer, pull out, and they still work. They still work. Which is amazing because the old style batteries never did that. <laughs> so that's just one little thing that you could do. Uh, the it next sounds like, steps, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but that just sounds like a really essential first step, which is, of course, you know, if you can't see, there's yes. really not much you can do once the sun goes down. So yeah. 
these are essentially flashlights, lanterns, et cetera, that yeah. you're saying are, are super efficient because they've got the modern LED technology and yes. then the batteries uh, are rechargeable. Um, and uh, are they batteries you take out and can use uh, interchangeably or is it a built-in battery to the device and you're charging that device? It's a built-in battery device. It is new lithium battery technology that is able to hold a charge a long, long time, does not run down. And it has more power for the, the density, for the size of the device. And uh, it's, uh, it's usually three-way charging, either solar or cigarette lighter or, you know, 110 uh, AC power um, if you have the right adapter. And one of the additional things a lot of these, as they keep expanding, have is a USB output. And there's a lot of uh, universal power starting to go on in the electronics world, which is very handy and it ties in to your cell phone and to your other devices. If you can also do an emergency charge on your phone, that helps with your communication. If you have any other little uh, USB type devices, then you can charge it off these items. Um, and as you move up the chain, there are some bigger devices now that have an even bigger battery pack that can run lighting longer. And even we're seeing some very good um, car-based uh, jump starter packs right now. With oh, really? Packs. Yeah, that are actually in the 1,000 to 2,000 milliamp range that very, very good. They will actually jump start many vehicles, have a light on them, have a USB output charge. So you're always going to have your communication device. You're going to have a light and you could jump start your car. So those are just really basic kind of stuff that you can get these days in the you know hundred to two hundred dollar range. All right, great. Know. That was my next question. Okay, yeah. great. So pretty affordable for very valuable fundamental kind of you know bottom of the pyramid resiliency here. Right? Exactly. This is what we call uh, personal preparedness mm -hmm. items. You know, the flashlight, the battery pack, and that kind of thing. And uh, they, they they keep scaling up uh, what we call personal level power lighting um it just starts small and then price wise and you know size wise and weight wise and it just scales up depending on you know what you want to do and how much you want to power um a lot of these are you know small and carryable you can throw them in a backpack or have them in the trunk of your car or even take them on a plane and some of them now include a, a, a lithium battery pack and an unfoldable uh you know Thin film solar, okay. So there's dual so, ways to charge it. Yeah, hybrid. So you can charge it either off a car, cigarette lighter, or any USB or the wall, or unfold it and put it in the sun. And those get even more uh, handy at that point. Um, they're still small enough to take with you, but they will do actual work, and that's the personal size power. Um, and sorry, any any brands that you. Like there, if someone's motivated to go research some of these? Yeah, things. we have uh, been extremely happy with uh, the hybrid light uh, flashlights that are out of Utah. Actually, we've been carrying them for like six, seven years and seen them in action. And they're, they're reasonably priced and very well. We consider them, from our perspective, one of the better made out there. Great. Um, and we've also been very happy with the uh, Sunjack uh, portable kits, too that are full uh, power packages that fold up. There's a number of new ones that are coming on that we're evaluating more that keep going up the chain. And it's a matter of, you know, making sure they work though and not being a throwaway. Um, this is this is the ongoing test of uh, quality control mm -hmm. that has to happen in our modern economy, you know. Great, all right, so we've got uh, the basics there with lighting, how about, how about power itself? So the next step up in the, uh, the, the power, the personal power chain is when you want to start having a, you know, 110 volt electricity AC to run, you know, your typical house power type things. Uh, the small level is, you know, electronics and laptops and uh, the LED lighting that's out now is a very good thing because uh, it takes very little electricity. Um, these days you can run a lot of stuff off a small amount of electricity because of the, uh, the revolution in energy efficiency mm -hmm. across the board. Um, and we're seeing that, um, in many, many, uh, items now, um, so that it's still allowing you to have a smaller system that could run 
a decent amount of things that you might need on your own. So these are things that you can own. And this is where we go into some of our uh, portable solar generator uh, stuff. That's like, you know, maybe a size up to just from just a little case to maybe like a rolling case or a cart uh, that is still portable, but you know, it's bigger in size, but it is movable. And now you can get into the kind of electricity that will run certain key items in your home. And we like to consider that um, the next step up from short term, you're kind of going into medium term preparedness resiliency around your home. So what are the key things that you might want to run in your home if the electricity is out for, you know, say three or four days, five days, heading towards seven days? Well, at that point, you might want to run your refrigerator. You might want to run your, you know, communications, your TV to watch news about the disaster. You might have uh, some, some kind of water pump that you might need. Um, which is, it's always dependent on how much that takes. Um, there's a lot of other appliances that you might be able to run in your house, you know, fans and uh, all kinds of things like that. We're talking about um, in the you know, 10 to 20 amp range, being able to pull an extension cord or get, you know, a few circuits in your house running. And that's in the next size up, kind of mid scale, still available that a solar generator can do. And these are devices that have everything included all in one, the battery and the inverter components and the solar controller and the solar panels. And that's one of our specialties. And we put those together as a bundle that you can buy and you can take with you. Um, and these can be also put in your backyard. And also, you, so you can run an extension cord into your house. Um, and run things as needed for the shorter to mid term. Great. And just um, tell people vision this. This yeah. is, you know, basically from what I've seen from the pictures on your site. I mean, this is a a, a, a uh, unit that has wheels. Yes. So it's it's sort of like a cart that you you like you said you can put out in your backyard. Mm -hmm. I imagine you you angle it towards yes. where it gets the best sun exposure. Yes. And then you run an extension cord from the unit into your house. But you can basically move this wherever you want. You can throw it in the back of a truck, take it somewhere if you wanted to take it with you to a, you know, a, if you have a you know, cabin or some other location that you go to where you want to have power while you're there. Yes. It's that type of transport, transportable ability, right? Exactly. It's personal size. If you have, you know, a, a small truck, a van, or vehicle there's there's different sizes there's smaller ones you could almost fit in a car you know it scales up and these are in the range of you know a thousand watt outputs up to three maybe even four thousand watt outputs you can get some different uh styles of them uh, some of them have the main you know box uh, on wheels the solar panel separate some of them tie together you know they'll fold down they'll come apart so it's easier to move uh, the advantage of these items is this is a completely self-contained plug-and-play unit and that you can move. It's not tied to your house electric or the grid. It's completely independent. And the other advantage they have is because the solar panels are separate, not attached to your roof, you can also move the solar panels to where the sun is right. or move them out of the zone of disaster as needed too as the case may be. Um, all of these items also are designed usually with uh, inbound chargers and they work really, really well if you want to extend the ability of your gas generator. We talked about the usual go-to for backup uh, house power, which is a lot of people have, which is a gas generator, which is great until you run out of gas. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have a gas generator, it's good to keep it filled and serviced at least and have some, you know, if you can store it safely, some extra gas. If you have one of these mid-sized solar generators, you can actually extend the runtime of your generators significantly by doing that. And we call that a hybrid system because the generator will charge the batteries up if the, if the solar is not doing very good, if it's really cloudy or rainy, obviously you're getting not much solar. 
but they all have batteries, which is kind of like the fuel tank, but the generator can charge those batteries up at any time. The generator also allows you to run your higher amperage stuff. If you have a you know, 3,000, 5,000, 6,000 watt generator, you can then, if you have to run your, say, your well pump or some heavier duty items that take 20 amps or more, you can do that just for the time they need to be done. But then you could turn your generator off and use your solar generator to run the smaller um, ticket items like your lighting and your electronics and stuff like that. We call that a power management and using the correct uh, tool for the job, so to speak. Um, and that what that does is it extends your runtime overall. By the hybrid system, you could switch it back and forth. And if you only have five gallons of gas, you want to get the maximum runtime. You can't out of that gas. Yeah. All right. So that's where that comes in handy. Yeah. Let's take a moment to talk about that. Um, so, you know, not everybody listening is, is going to know exactly what you mean when you say a 20 amp, uh, you know, uh, app, uh, 20 amp uh, uh, appliance or whatnot. Yeah. Um, but basically, the, the, the higher the amps, the more power draw that, uh, that, that appliance uses. And so, Exactly. I think a good example of, of, of where you would need the power of a gas power generator would be mm-hmm. like, let's say you want to run a closed dryer. Closed right? dryer, yes. Um, mm-hmm. But for like an Energy Star uh, refrigerator, that's yes. going to use an awful lot less. And so that would be a really good candidate for the, the, yes. the solar power generator. And so, you know, what I like about what, what you're constructing here with this hybrid system is I've got a system that in theory lets me do a lot more. And I can extend the power of both sources much longer by using the best source for the best moment. Of course, the solar generator is great when the sun's shining. It's much less good at night. And so, you know, you switch over uh, mm-hmm. uh, to the gas generator for, for, you know, anything the solar generator can't do at night. Mm-hmm. Um, but you use that gas generator for the, the, the higher amp, the, the maybe, you know, the things you're going to do less frequently but are more important at times, like yes. pulling water from your well. And then if, if, you know, unfortunately the, the power outage lasts long, so long that you run out of gas, at least you've got that solar one to, yeah. you know, do a reduced load for as long as you can. Yeah, and that, that's a good way to do it. And this brings in the third item that really helps all this uh, happen in the planning of your home, which is the importance of energy efficiency. Mm-hmm. When you're thinking about your appliances and your usage of electricity, Right now, if you go uh, Energy Star on all your appliances, if you change all your lights to LED, if you have more recent uh, uh, electronic kind of stuff, more uh, uh, flat screen TVs and uh, modern computers, just everything coming out of the last five years has really been uh, accelerated in the energy efficiency department. And that fact alone really sets you up to be able to run much longer in your home if you've done that work on energy efficiency because you're basically needing less electric for everything. And that is a key, key difference when it comes down to having no outside power for the grid. Uh, If you don't need as much electricity to run your house, then you can run a lot more and for a lot longer. And that's how it works. And uh, the amount of, uh, you know, equipment you'll need to run things will also be reduced too. Um, Now, as we move into the the medium term backup power into your house, it's very important that people uh, understand you can't just take a gas generator or a solar generator and try and plug it back into the grid. There is some safety considerations. The utilities are always talking to people about that. You hear about it in Florida. Um, it's very important that any kind of system like that, you have a safety disconnect switch installed by a professional electrical contractor that's between your meter and your main box that allows you, if you want the capability of putting power back in your house, uh, it can do that safely without backfeeding the grid. This has been an ongoing issue whenever there's a da- disaster in these places with everybody firing up generators and trying to plug it straight in their grid. You do not want to feed power back to the grid because that puts the utility workers in danger. And it's an unsafe situation. So I wanted to point that out. Um, That's a really good idea as a homeowner to make sure you have that installed. Very least, it turns off the power to the grid when you want to plug something into your grid. You can feed power 
then through your, your network. Um, the next step up from that is some people are even putting in a, a, a essential needs sub panel into their house from an electrical contractor that just puts the key circuits that you might need, say like a couple lighting circuits, your pump, your refrigerator, any other kind of item like that, that just uh, is essential needs. And that way, some of these systems, you could just feed that sub panel box and it can be done professionally and then it's all set up and it makes it real nice. Great. And so that's basically a direct line from the generator to that essential needs. Correct. Right. Yeah. The simplest one is a, is a plug on the side of your house that will come from your generator, either 220 or 110, depending, uh, with a switch that, that turns off your main meter. So you can feed power back in either from a gas generator or from a solar generator. And this goes up to the, the, even the, the longer term solution now that's coming on very strongly is more sophisticated, larger battery backup systems that are coming on the market that are directly designed to intertie with uh, grid, grid solar. If you have grid tie solar on your house, and more and more people are looking at the uh, options for that and the uh, advantages, including all the tax breaks. Most of the grid tie will not work if the grid goes down. If the utility power is not there, almost all the grid ties installed in America will stop functioning. Um, this has been an item we've been continually pointing out to people um, for the last 10 years. Um, that is starting to be rectified by some new integrated battery backup uh, energy appliances that are coming on the market, and we're involved in that. That will install, for instance, in your garage uh, or somewhere in your home that actually will store power from the rooftop grid, uh, panels and be able to run your whole house. Usually they're fed into that essential needs sub-panel. And that's a full solar contractor, electrical contractor type of install by a professional. These are very sophisticated. Uh, one of the key things they do right off the bat, though, is give you um, up to, you know, 4 to 8 kW or maybe 12 kW of backup power on your home. Essentially, you can be independent on power if you want. There's some other features to them that are really handy. People looking to reduce their utility bill. Because you have that much storage, you can uh, basically uh, load shift your power and get uh, you know much better utility rates. Right. Uh, you can you can do all kinds of tricks with the uh, time of use rates with various utilities and that kind of thing. Uh, we predict these are going to start coming on really hot and heavy. There's some new incentives coming on, uh, certainly in California for this kind of thing. We see that as a big improvement of the resiliency of the uh, electric grid in America. These kind of items are going really uh, big in other parts of the world, including in Japan, since Fukushima mm -hmm. happened, and in Germany, where the government was very promoting to coming off the nuclear power too. So, uh, so these like very first world uh, economy and nations are, are quite ahead of America in the installation of the you know home-based and business-based battery backup system. Great. So, I mean, basically you're saying it's it's been already battle-tested in these other developed nations, and uh, all we need to do is, is catch up, basically. Yeah. They're, they're, they're proven out right now. The lithium battery technology is finally stabilizing. It's gone through a few rounds of, you know, testing and engineering, and they're, they're getting very sophisticated uh, how these works. And, that, you know, that's an additional add-on. For, for a homeowner, but when you think about uh, the cost, uh, you know, items of what would it cost you to have no electricity for, you know, two weeks, um, starts looking pretty good there. Yeah, and it also sounds like, uh, you know, you would be able to potentially save money uh, with the system installed because you can basically draw from your battery storage and when electricity costs a lot on the grid and then only draw from the grid during the times of use where it's cheaper. Correct. Yeah, this is actually, uh, there, there's actually an economic um, reason that you think can be presented over your overall costs on this when you throw in the tax credits and the, you know, you could almost zero out your electric bill if you wanted to. Right. So let me, let me just sort of repeat this back to you to make sure that I understand it because um, I think this is really big news and we have a number of listeners who 
you know, have solar installations on their homes, but are, I would imagine the majority of them are grid tied as opposed to, to off grid. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the downsides of grid tied, uh, you know, solar production on your house is that when the grid goes down, you lose that electricity. You don't, you don't get access to, to, to electricity, even the ones that your panels are generating. So yeah. you, if, if there's a blackout in your area, there's a blackout in your house. Correct. Um, unless you're totally off grid, which, you know, comes with its own set of challenges. Yeah. Um, and of course we've got some, some folks who are listening who are off grid as well, but the, the challenge has been, you kind of have to be one or the other for most people. Correct. What you're now saying is that people who are grid tied now have the ability to be off grid mm -hmm. in a grid down event. Um, with these these interim uh, battery backup solutions that you're talking about. Correct. Yeah, that so true. that does sound like a pretty big game changer. That's really encouraging to hear. It's all about the batteries and uh, the integration aspect of it. And uh, it's, it's really come to, to a head and is moving quite along because of the technology. Great. Now, you said earlier, you know, it makes total sense. This is something that should be installed and, and set up by a professional contractor. Absolutely. J two things. One, are there, are there particular systems that you like? Again, brands that people can investigate. And then ballpark, what's this going to cost somebody who has a grid-tied house to be able to convert to this interim? We're looking at, um, you know, several that are coming on very, very closely, um, there was quite a lot of hype um, over the last couple of years with the Tesla Powerwall. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, those are not readily commercially available at this time. And there's still some issues that are being worked out. Um, we have not seen them as, as a, as a go-to solution yet. Uh, there's been a lot of requests and inquiries about that, but not there. Uh, the two we're working with right now are Sonnen which is a major German company that's doing a huge footprint in Europe, integrated battery uh, complete package that drops in with any kind of grid tie solar. The other one we're looking at is out of Japan, Tabuchi Electric. That is very, very sophisticated, and I feel like those two are some of the primes that we're looking at right now. Um, there's a, they're scalable in the battery size of the system, so you're looking at anywhere absolute minimum 10 to 15,000 probably with install on up to you know 20 25,000 uh, it's a matter of the size of the system how much electricity you want overall at one point um, you want 4kw you want 8kw you want 12kw and then the other uh, optional item is how much battery storage you want for instance do you want uh, one, two, three days of storage. So size of the battery. So that scales up to and it impacts the cost. And then you have the cost of a professional solar contractor installing everything and doing your sub panel box. Um, it's, a, it's a system design uh, to be done right. But once you have that, that's going to give you a lot of peace of mind. Uh, I would think that it would be the cap of your... Uh, solar uh, investment that you have on your roof to finish that off and then have that device in there to store your power. That kind of completes a circle really. Okay. Oh, well, thanks for, for detailing that out. And so it sounds like sort of somewhere between 10 grand to 25 grand, you know, given the complexity of the system. Yes. And uh, the cost of that could be partially defrayed by some of the tax credits and stuff like that. This is correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Well, so you've taken us then through sort of the, the primary, you know, the, the, the immediate personal steps, the intermediary. And now we're talking about, you know, much longer term with, with uh, uh, you know, these, these long term uh, electrical production systems that we're talking about in storage systems. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, does that complete the does that complete this, the system or is there any other parts of, of home power you think people should be? Well, I think that's the layout is, is, is to consider is, you know, small, medium, large, and the cost factor follows that same mm -hmm. pattern. And it also follows exactly with what you're trying to do. You know, if you're just trying to get a little bit of electricity, okay, you can keep it simple and it moves up the scale and cost and size and, maneuver, you know, portability. And then if you're looking for the long term, you know, real solution, Obviously, that's an investment for the long term. Um, every one of these also includes a, a caveat of um, 
learning a little bit more about how you use power so you can be smarter about it. So that energy efficiency comes in mm-hmm. really strong. Um, you start looking at your the rest of your electric use and going, how can I do this smarter? You know, and that applies to you know your pumps, your usage patterns, your appliances, your lighting. You know, across the board. Uh, you know, work smarter, not harder. We say. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, there's an interesting little little key points on some of these and caveats too that. Um, and directly related to the uh, the hurricanes, especially in you know, Texas and Florida and uh, Puerto Rico, which is a, maybe a benefit for the smaller portable ones, is that um, a key item in the news is that all the roofs were ripped off in the hurricane areas. Well, if your solar array is attached to your roof, <laughs> that might not work out so well for you. Um, Very good point. <laughs> so um, one of the things that some people are doing more of the uh, extreme uh, prepper type uh, folks are considering is the ability to be able to put equipment in an area that will withstand, you know, 150 mile an hour wind or, you know, and, you know, debris flying through the air. So that's high level preparedness. And, um, that's possibly more of a, you know, basement type situation that mm-hmm. you can get your, you know, equipment into uh, or something else that's really locked down. Um, you know, if you have a portable generator that's somewhat movable, for instance, you can actually get that into an area that if you know that, you know, a weather related or hurricane tornado is going, you could move it out of harm's way. Because if your if your house and your systems you know damaged or destroyed in the weather, well, there goes your electric too. Right. So you know that's just a consideration. Um, there's another uh, point in there that's uh, been brought up in some of the disaster preps too, which is what about EMT pulse, uh, solar flares, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and that's been discussed also with the idea of once again. Secure areas for your equipment, portable. We've seen people uh, take, you know, the uh, shipping containers that are metal. And, you know, if you have a property having your, you know, preparedness uh, zone possibly packed into a shipping container, that you do a big fat ground to earth. And that actually there's a, a lot of theories that in an EMT pulse or solar flare situation that it would fry a lot of electrical stuff that would be a huge problem in the aftermath um and there's a lot of theories that say that if you can put that into you know a steel cage that's well grounded you have a much better shot of your key electrical items making it through yeah so you know essentially create a Faraday cage of whatever size you can, whether it's something that can fit in your basement or whether it's something large like a shipping container, but, yes. but stored some percentage of your yeah. your electrical tools there, essential electrical tools there, so that if there is yeah. some sort of EMP and everything does get fried, you've at least got some that have survived. That would might be the, uh, you know, the gold standard of a, of a backup is if you had a 40-foot container that was, uh, you know, really locked down to the earth in concrete, bolted down and with a big fat ground strap and you put your key items in there, you know, might as well put some water and food in there too and some uh, extra fuel and certainly your your solar uh, generating equipment or in your power equipment, you might stand a good chance of getting through a lot of situations. Uh, it's just a theory. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, yeah, that's that's definitely getting to the belt and suspenders part, but but those are definitely real risks. And we've talked to uh, uh, an expert from NASA a couple of times on this program about the risk of, of simply a solar flare and uh, you know something of the magnitude of the uh, you know, Carrington event that happened back in the uh, mm-hmm. in the nineteen hundreds eighteen hundreds happening again. And uh, uh, you know it sadly is not a dismissible risk. So no, um, I think no. that's you know wise to point out the, the wisdom of doing that if you can. Yeah, it's something to think about. Um, you know, all, all this is really, you know, looking at the, the idea of preparedness and uh, the economics of it is uh, 
the real cost differential between long-term thinking or sustainable thinking, you might say, versus the short-term immediate, you know, ROI, so to speak, from a spreadsheet. Um, many, many spreadsheets I've seen don't have a column for, you know, those kind of, uh, you know, really large scale situations where, you know, infrastructure breaks down. Right. And right. there's a, there's a missing column and number in that. Like what, what does that cost? You know? Yeah. Well, it sounds like anybody who's putting solar on their house, this just should be part of the decision-making process, which is that's a large investment. They're already, you know, working with professional contractors on the design mm-hmm. and yeah. certainly up there should be, okay, well, you know, how, how resilient do you want to be in a grid down event? And for 10,000 more, 15,000 more, 20,000 more, we can, we can add these redundancies into your home system. Exactly. It just, it just allows you to be more in charge of your, your own situation and, you know, be able to ride out, you know, uh, infrastructure breakdowns and just be, you know, more prepared, you know, more resilient and, uh, not dependent on some outside agency to, come rescue you or, you know, all that kind of stuff is just going to be kind of things that in the long run are going to make, uh, you know, more strong communities and more abilities to bounce back over any kind of disaster that you could think of. Right. Well, and as we've seen both in Houston, Florida and in the Caribbean now, uh, you know, many, many people were completely unprepared for what happened to them. And of course, these were these are major disasters that have happened. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's hard to be fully prepared for a Cat 4 or Cat 5 hurricane. No. Um, or a 7.4 magnitude earthquake. Um, but, um, you know, one of the the more important and more inspiring parts uh, that we're seeing in the aftermath are the people who do have resources, whether it's skills or, you know, they've got, you know, anything from a bit of extra water to they've got power when their neighbors don't. And they're being part of the solution, right? They're, they're there to help out those people who were prepared or had their preparations swept away by the disaster. So, you know, putting yourself in a position where you can not only take care of your immediate self and family, but also be in service to those in your community. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we need as many people to be able to play that role um, when these types of tragedies occur. Yes. Um, this is an interesting thought on that too, that I just read an article about the, uh, the kind of public disaster preparedness uh, groups, uh, the CERT trainings that were going around uh, that started uh, usually at the volunteer fire departments and they, they wanted to reach out. This was part of the uh, transition town movement. This came up a lot to uh, get more of the neighborhoods and the local communities somewhat organized along this idea of having, you know, preparedness items and equipment and training, uh, you know, somewhat together to know where the resources are and when things really break down to be able to reach out to your immediate neighbors. And, uh, uh, the, the authorities might not be answering the phone. And so better start talking to your neighbors at that point. Yeah. And, you know, I was literally just watching the news this morning. That is the situation in Puerto Rico right now where the, uh, the police, the, the, the other, uh, you know, civil authorities there have basically said, we are not, uh, we're not available right now. You know, yeah. we're, we're taking care of both our own personal families as well as just trying to get our, our systems back online. Mm-hmm. And so you can't count on us for at least the next couple of days. Right. So, I mean, it's not a, it's not a theoretical, this could happen someday. We're actually watching it happen right now in a U.S. territory. So. Yeah. And live and direct in, in uh, real time cell phone videos and, uh, it's a very uh, sobering reality check to uh, think about ahead. As we tell people to call in after disaster, please don't wait till after disaster to call us. Right. It, it will cost a lot more mm-hmm. and your credit card won't work. <laughs> That's right. Well, Chad, and, and Chad, Chad's in wrapping this up, um, uh, I, I'm going to suspect that there's a number of people listening to this podcast who uh, have been inspired to take some advanced action here. Um, so uh, we mentioned at the beginning of the podcast that you, you run a company, Soul Solutions. Yes. Um, I'm going to put you on the spot here and, uh, one, give you an opportunity for to direct people who want to learn more about you and, and a number of the products that you discussed, where they can go. 
Uh, but I imagine a lot of people here are going to have questions, yes. um, especially because a number of the solutions you talked about, you know, really should be done um, in partnership with a, a licensed contractor mm -hmm. to make sure they're done right. Um, are you open to people contacting you with questions that you either can ask directly or refer them to solutions? Absolutely. Yeah. We've actually been developing our website to have some uh, educational material and learning around solar and some of these topics I talked about and we keep adding on to this and in fact Adam this may inspire me to uh, rewrite uh, and you know, a new uh, five-year version of the what do you do when the power goes out uh, white paper for you that'd be great um, if you could. so I'm, I'm thinking there's a lot of material there to add to that now um, we have some stuff like that on our website at Soul Solutions is our company www soul s o l dash or hyphen solutions soul dash solutions dot com is our website uh, my email is chaz c h a z at soul dash solutions dot com and our phone number we're based in Sonoma County here in Northern California seven zero seven five one five six seven eight three great well thank you for generously making all that contact information available to our folks. Yeah. Uh, I do suspect that that uh, you will get a number of questions from folks. Folks who are listening will put links to Chaz's site and his uh, email address and, and the uh, the uh, um, educational materials he mentioned uh, uh, that will all accompany this podcast, uh, so you'll be able to find it directly. Um, Jess, it's been a great discussion. I really appreciate you taking the time to go into this. I know there's a couple of other sort of meaty discussions related to this material um, oh, yeah. <laughs> like the level of solvency of the government, uh, uh, you know, funds that are available to, to bail out these uh, uh, these post disaster areas. And, and of course, you know, there's a lot of malincentives there for people just to simply rebuild in places where mm -hmm. there's probably going to be another natural disaster quite soon. So um, I, I want to flag that for as material for a future podcast, because I think we could go another 45 yeah. minutes on just those alone. But I really appreciate you bringing your expertise to this topic. It's, it's very timely and very important. Well, I appreciate the invitation, Adam, and I really uh, I'm happy and uh, supportive of what you guys have been doing with the uh, community you're doing on website and bringing the material that you share together to offer to people. And I've been tracking it for a while. I'm on the same page. Well, thanks, Jess. All right. Well, uh, we'll get you back here soon. Thank you much.